Uh, Asif from uh, UC Berkeley. He will talk about understanding negative capacitance dynamics in the ferroelectric capacitors. Hello and welcome. This is Asif Khan from University of California at Berkeley. Uh, thanks, Chairman, for the nice introduction. So uh, in the next 10 minutes of the day, I'll talk about a different mechanism of reducing power dissipation in electronics, the negative capacitance concept. So in this talk, I'll talk about the exper recent experimental demonstration of negative capacitance, where we directly measured negative capacitance. And this really sets the stage where we can now optimize and fabricate negative capacitance transistors with milliman power dissipation. So with that, let's get started with the concept of negative capacitance. So the basic concept is to replace the oxide with a negative capacitance material. Now, how does it work? I'll explain briefly. So the, if you look at a no conventional transistor with a positive oxide, positive capacitance in the gate oxide, you'll see that the gate voltage, for a given gate voltage, the interface potential, the potential at the oxide and the semiconductor interface will always be smaller than the applied gate voltage. But replace this oxide material with a negative capacitance material. For a given gate voltage, you can actually have a larger interface potential. And as a result, what you can show is that for a smaller gate voltage, you can have a larger charge and in turn a larger current in the device compared to that you can get in a conventional transistor. So mathematically, if you look at the substitution swing, it is a product of two factors. One is the 60 millivolts per decade, which comes from the Boltzmann distribution, multiplied by the factor called M. And M is the body factor, which is the ratio of the applied gate voltage to the interface potential. And if you have a conventional transistor where your semiconductor capacitance and oxide capacitance both are positive, this M will be larger than 1. In a negative capacitance transistor, however, since oxide is negative, your M can become smaller than 1. And as a result, your subthreshold swing can go below 60 millivolts per decade. And that really gives you a new technique to reduce the power uh, voltage in a, in a CMOS technology and in turn reduce the power dissipation. So, so far I have talked about the concept, but I have not really told you how to get a negative capacitance material. And that's the main story that I'm going to tell you. So capacitance. Capacitance is the rate of increase of charge with voltage. If you have a positive capacitor, you increase the charge, voltage, your charge will increase. On the other hand, if you have a negative capacitor, the charge will decrease as you increase the voltage. You can also define a capacitance in terms of energy. So energy is Q squared by 2C. If you have a positive capacitor, your energy landscape looks like this, which has a positive radius of curvature at Q equals to 0. On the other hand, if you have a negative capacitor, your energy landscape will look like an inverted parabola, where the radius of curvature here is negative at Q equals to 0. So how do we get a material that has an energy landscape that looks like this? And according to the Landau theory, Ferroelectrics has an energy landscape, double well energy landscape, which under certain charge conditions can give you a negative capacitance. So let me give you a brief uh, overview of ferroelectric materials. This is a unit cell of a ferroelectric material, and you can see that the central atom here is not at the center of symmetry of the unit cell, rather it's slightly off-centered. And this off-centering really gives you a spontaneous polarization without an electric field, and you can get a spontaneous polarization in both direction. And the most defining factor of a ferroelectric is that you can switch the direction of the polarization by applying an electric field larger than the coercive field of the ferroelectric material. All right, so how does the unit cell correspond to the negative capacitance or the energy landscape? So if you look at the energy landscape, the two minima of the energy landscape corresponds to the two directions of the spontaneous polarization. And for negative capacitance, the unit cell should look like symmetric. All right, so I'll look back, I'll take a little bit of perspective here. So the first ferroelectrics was discovered very early in 1920s, but to date, uh, until we rep reported our results, no one really directly measured negative capacitance. And why is that? The reason is very simple. It's because the, the negative capacitance state is an unstable one which means that if you want to put the charge or polarization on top of the barrier, it will automatically fall down to one of the minima. And as a result, if you want to measure the negative capacitance by directly connecting it to an impedance analyzer, you will measure a positive capacitance, not a negative capacitance, because that state is unstable. So how do we measure the negative capacitance? And that is the first question we asked. 
So for that, we again go back to this energy landscape picture, and we start from a uh, situation like this. We apply a voltage, which is smaller than the coercive voltage, so the energy landscape tilts, and the polarization will fall down. But as you note, there is a barrier here, and the polarization actually did not go into this negative capacitance region yet. All right, so now we apply a voltage which is larger than the coercive voltage. The energy landscape gets tilted further, and note that there is no barrier now. And as a result, the polarization will fall down. And as it falls down, it will go through this negative capacitance region. And that is really the insight that we got from this analysis, and that's the experiment that we did. So I'll explain the experiment. So before that, uh, we chose, let me explain the growth technique. We used a lead zirconic titanate as our ferroelectric material and grew this material on top of metallic strontium ruthenate uh, buffered strontium titanate substrate. We grew this technique using a technique called pulse laser deposition. Uh, and this is a typical uh, TM image which shows that we have high quality samples. All right, so this is the experiment that we did. So we took a ferroelectric material, which is an insulator, and connected it in series with a voltage source through an external resistor. And as we applied the voltage pulse, we measured the voltage across the ferroelectric and the applied voltage using an oscilloscope. Okay. So now a little bit of uh, basic understanding of regular RC circuits, resistor and capacitor series combination. So as we all know that if we apply a voltage across a series combination of a resistor and capacitor, the voltage across the capacitor and the charge across the cap capacitor will increase with a time constant of RC. And if you look at any time step, the change in the charge and change in the voltage will both have the same sign. And if you take the ratio of dQ and the dVc, it will come out to be a positive number and exactly equal to the capacitance of the capacitor. All right, so let's look at the experimental details. Now this is an sli important slide, I'll spend uh, some time over here. So we took a 16 nanometer lead zirconate titanate film, which has a coercive voltage of two and a half volts. And we applied an AC pulse of 5.4 volts. This, this is the time, <coughs> these are the transients. So here, the black curve with white dots is the voltage applied across the ferroelectric resistance combination. And the black curve with the green dots is the voltage measured across the ferroelectric. Now what you can see is the initial part of the transient, you can see that the voltage across the ferroelectric increases. However, what is interesting is what happens is during this step, time step AB, you can see that the voltage across the ferroelectric actually decreases. And there is a blown up image of that transient. However, if you look into the charge over here, you can see that the charge is actually increasing, which means that during this transient, time AB, the voltage across the ferroelectric is decreasing while the charge is increasing, which means that the dQ by dV is negative here. And that is clearly a negative capacitance uh, transient. And also when the ferroelectric switches to the other direction, we again see the opposite sign of change of charge and voltage. So <coughs> in this experiment, we can at each time step, we can measure the voltage across the ferroelectric and the charge across the ferroelectric. And then we can draw the charge voltage characteristics of the ferroelectric. And this is what it looks like when we plot the charge voltage characteristics. And clearly, in certain region of charge and voltage, we see a negative slope. And this is actually the first time that a negative slope has been reported experimentally in a ferroelectric uh, material. And this was published earlier this year. So we did not stop there. So we did more sanity checks to make sure that this is, this is really a ferroelectric signature, not some extrinsic effects. So for that, initially, uh, in the energy landscape picture, I showed that when the voltage applied is smaller than the coercive voltage, the ferroelectric does not switch its direction. And as a result, it does not go through the negative capacitance region, and we do not expect a negative capacitance transient. So for this sample, the coercive voltage was 2.5 volts. Now when we apply, is smaller than two and a half volts, we do not see any negative capacitance transient. So it's really a regular positive capacitance transient that we see. So the next experiment was similar, but in this case we applied 
two positive pulses. Initial direction of the polarization was pointing up. So when we apply the first pulse, it switches the direction of the polarization. And as a result, we do see that the voltage across the ferroelectric decreases. Now the first pulse has already switched the direction of the polarization. So when we apply the second pulse, it does not switch the direction of polarization. And as a result, we do not see the negative capacitance transient. And that really shows that what we are seeing is coming because of this negative capacitance transient from the ferroelectric switching. All right, so we have shown this effect in lead zirconate titanate. So is this a general phenomena across different ferroelectrics? So, so far we have studied many other materials and many traditional ferroelectrics, including barium titanate, bismuth ferrite, all these materials indeed show this negative capacitance phenomenon. So this really tells that this is a general ferro phenomenon in ferroelectrics. And so that really comes, uh, brings me to the last topic of the talk, which is that did we really discover something new? And the answer is that no. Even in 19 early days of ferroelectrics, in 1950s and 60s, there were clear signatures of negative capacitance. But they did not really connect it to the phenomenon of negative capacitance. And only because we have a re technological reason to explore this phenomenon, we connected the dots. And with that, let me summarize. We have uh, detected negative capacitance. And this really sets a stage where we can now design, fabricate, and optimize the negative capacitance transi transistors with the minimal amount of power dissipation. With that, let me thank our sponsors, and I invite questions. All right. Thank you very much. Open to question. Yes. Can you shine some light on the error bars you had on the experimental data I took? Uh, the error bars. Uh, okay. Because so as an experimentalist, I always like to see those. Uh, so uh, let me explain the experiments. So uh, what you can see is that this is an oscillogram meaning that we have a measurement directly taken from the oscilloscope. So that means that there is noise actually there. So what in the experiments, we made sure that the, uh, the error, but due to the uh, noise, is much larger, much smaller than this signal. And as you can see that the noise was pretty small. Uh, th thanks, Asif. It was a really clear explanation. It's very Hello. useful. Um, uh, I, I have one question, though. What, uh, you have proven it, but we, this has nothing to do with uh, clearing up the hysteresis part. Mm -hmm. This is you, you have proven that this phenomena exists. It will give you steep sure. uh, switching at one point if you're going one direction, but now we have to work on to uh, deliver right. the lower hysteresis, right? Mm -hmm. okay. So I have, I will, I can tell you two things. Based on the simulation, so right now this is not stabilized negative capacitance. You can stabilize it only when you have put a series capacitor, which can be the MOS capacitors there. And with proper, that's what I was talking about, the proper design. With proper design, you can reduce the uh, hysteresis. Now, experimentally, we do actually, uh, which I did not talk about, experimentally, we do see that you can reduce the hysteresis to around uh, below 100 millivolts. I did not show those experiments, but it is clear from our experiments that we can really stabilize it properly with a very minimal amount of hysteresis. Okay, one more question. Yep. Yes. Uh, now, when you're sweeping with this uh, uh, oscillatory uh, wave, uh, you're passing through the metastable region of right. the capacitor. Now, I suppose you, you, uh, it will go very fast. Once it's in the metal, metastable region, it will fall off exactly. the peak very quickly. So it seems to me the shape that you get here, the negative peaks, depend upon how f what is the oscillation frequency that, of these measurements. And if you go too slow, you might not see this negative peak. Okay. So how fast do you have to go to see it? All right, so I have a slide for that, so let me go to that quickly. Okay, 
So you can see that the, the time scale that I was showing was around 100 microseconds there. So as we reduce, so remember th there was a resistance in series. Now as we reduce the resistance to 2 kilo ohms, the time scale actually became 350 nanoseconds. And if I plot the time scale as a function of resistance, you can see that it linearly goes down. And if you extrapolate it to zero resistance, you'll see that this number is very small, around one nanosecond or even smaller than that. So the answer is that there is no fundamental limit as to how fast it can be. So it can be very fast. So you're saying it will be negative, but it could be negative for a very brief time. Uh, and, uh, but if you have a big series resistor, it'll slow it down somewhat. Okay, so, right. So in this experiment, we had a resistance, and for this case, it is an uh, we are not stabilizing it. But if you have a capacitor or a MOS MOSCAP, then it will stabilize at the negative capacitance region, which will make the metastable state a stable state. Right. Okay. I think uh, let's thanks speak again. I think with that, uh, we want to conclude this session. Thanks so much.